Hi, I'm Josh Bassiches, Director and CEO of the Royal Ontario Museum. Welcome to this special online presentation of our signature lecture series, Rom Speaks. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation since time immemorial to today. From fascinating viewpoints to thought-provoking insights, Rom Speaks presents the brightest minds and most compelling voices on ideas that matter across art, culture, and nature. Please enjoy this essential new addition to our Rom at Home digital programming. And I look forward to welcoming you back to the museum for more programs like this when it is safe to do so. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm very honored to be here and humbled that you would join me tonight. I want to thank the ROM and all the organizers who helped me get here. Uh, and thanks in advance to Gabrielle for hosting the Q&A at the end. I've been a big admirer of hers for years, so I'm honored she's here. And I want to also thank to, thanks um, to all the artists for letting me use their work tonight. You heard some of it playing you into your seats. Uh, they remain an inspiration for me and making space for indigenous artists and storytellers remains the central focus of my work. And then they honor me tonight with that work. So when the Ram approached me to speak here tonight, I, I must admit I was a bit humbled and very daunted by the request. Looking to the future is a challenge, and knowing where to begin, especially when we are in such a crucial moment in our history, was enough to make me wonder if it was even possible in a 45-minute talk. However, I'm going to do my best. And as you'll see, I'm going to end up mostly talking about the past and the present, because of course, without those, there is no future. They are what inform and shape what will come. So it's important to understand both what has contributed to our arrival at this point, and in turn, how our actions today will resonate in the future. But I want to, to start this evening with what this talk isn't because I think it's important to, to talk about what I'm not going to do here this evening. So first and foremost, this talk isn't reconciliation. As a term, reconciliation has taken on many meanings, many ideas, and even some actions. The TRC commissioners set out 94 recommendations to guide us, but few have truly been fulfilled. And this is not a failure of the TRC, or even of individual Canadians, or even, at this point, institutions. I think it's a failure of collective will and imagination. We must imagine what is possible, and that it is possible, to reshape the very nature of a nation. That fundamental core change is possible on a national level, even if it seems daunting. And I don't think we've quite, quite reached that point, which is why, for me, storytelling is still central to this mission. A storytelling change in Canada is necessary to move and inspire our collective imaginations. So no, this talk is not reconciliation. If anything, I hope it might be considered truth, which is where Canada is currently located in the process, and frankly, where it needs to stay for a little while. It's not a comfortable place to be, but you have to keep in mind that reconciliation is really for non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. For Indigenous peoples, this is a time of healing, and healing intergenerational trauma of the scale that our communities, our families, and our, in, ourselves as individuals face is not a weekend project. This lecture is also not about Indigenous people getting over it, as if centuries of ongoing colonialism can be reduced to, to a subject pronoun. There can be a sense that looking to the future means moving beyond the past. But as you'll see, I believe we must truly understand the past in order to map a future. So no, we won't be getting over anything tonight. And if we are going to get over anything tonight, I hope it's fear. But we'll get to that in a little bit. The work of reconciliation is a generational project. It cannot be reduced to my lifetime or yours, 
or even our children's, let alone the term of a single government. Nations form their identity over years, decades, and centuries, and the conversations we're having now, like tonight, are not an end in and of themselves, but rather part of the pathway to refining and hopefully reshaping Canada's national identity to be one where Indigenous peoples take their rightful place as central to the national story of Canada. But make no mistake, we are still at the beginning of this process, and there is still many, many growing pains ahead for Canada. These are tough truths to hear, tough truths to tell, but we must do this. There is no easy path, and indeed, in its difficulty, will come its greatest transformative power. So let's get to what this lecture is actually about. The future present. So I'm writing a book, so per, and my agent insisted I mention it. <laughs> I'm writing a book, so perhaps it's no surprise I refer to this as in, a, in a literary term. Um, as beings who exist in the present, we live in the echoes of the past. That's what the future is. The reverberations of the past, like an echo in a canyon. It can be heard for a long distance, but it only echoes the noises you make, the words you say, the actions you take. So key to understanding the present and in turn where we are going is to understand the past. We are the product of choices made before we were here, by our loved ones, our family, and by the society, the culture, and the nation where we reside. So when thinking of what Indigenous futures may look like in Canada, it is of vital importance that we acknowledge that the Indigenous present is the result of choices made in the past. So that means that I am the present, the promised vision of one vision of what the future of Indigenous peoples in Canada was to be. I am the embodiment of what Canada hoped to achieve through the previous 150 years of Indigenous policy from the colonial nation-state. An assimilated First Nations man with a settler father and an Anishinaabe mother divorced from my community, from my culture, from my language, from our stories, and from the land. This was, after all, the goal of residential schools, the most pernicious and diabolical assault on Indigenous peoples that Canada has mustered as a state. War, starvation, disease, relocation, all tactics used against Indigenous peoples in the establishment of Canada. But it was the war on our families through our children that proved most effective. And we must acknowledge as we see nation states continue to attack families, Indigenous families, whether through the child welfare system or through immigration policy that they do this because they know it works. Disrupting the family affects not just the present, but the future. These are attacks on the future. These, are, these acts are meant to forge the future like a bar of steel through heat and violent pressure. So when the Indian agent came to take my grandmother, Norma Miyawasagi, she's there on the right, in the back row. When they came to take her to St. Joseph's School for Girls in Spanish Ontario in 1933, as they would for five of the six Miyawasagi children, they were not just imagining her future, forging her future, they were forging mine. When the nuns at St. Joseph's would torture her, there's her class photo, when they would torture her, hitting her, whipping her, striking her tongue with a ruler, or freezing it to the flagpole outside in the winter because she spoke Ojibwe, the goal was not just to stop her from speaking our language, but also to stop me, to stop my mother from teaching me, and in turn, to keep me from teaching my children. It's very effective. But we also need to be clear on something else. They did this to shape my future for sure, but they also did it to shape yours. We must all wrestle with the knowledge 
that our nations or governments or communities or organizations may do things on our behalf that we don't approve of or like or even wish to bear witness. But that does not erase our place as the result of those actions. And indeed, what Canada is truly reconciling is that people suffered, that people are still suffering, so that others may be comfortable, so that others could speak their native language on lands where it is foreign. And that's where the discomfort comes from, you know, that children suffered and died so that Canada could be, and that children are still suffering and still dying so that Canada can remain. For the imagined future of Canada was one without Indigenous peoples. We were meant to be absent, disappeared, our past and present wiped away so that we may be invisible in Canada's future. And when I see these photos of my grandmother, there she is on the bridge in Serpent River with her brother Leonard. They're both gone, but the bridge is still there. When I see these, these photos and when I hear her voice, as I do tonight, I am reminded that they suffered, they died, so that I may be here. And so that I may be here in the way that I am, in a foreign language, my hair cut short. For when it was long, it attracted more police than it did spirits. So that I may be here specifically talking to you as I am tonight. Because I have been made acceptable through their suffering. I have been made a palatable native for Canada. I'm the Indian Canada is comfortable with. The one forged through heat and pressure. Because I am the outcome of the system of Canada, the, can the system of Canada was so eager to see. And because of that, I am the first celebrated by it. I understand that I'm here tonight, not just because I've been on the radio for years, as they said in that intro, or that my voice is deep and reassuring. <laughs> that helps with radio, though. And I'm not here because my thoughts are so wise and so smart for you to listen to, but because my skin is a lighter shade of brown than my cousins in the north. My accent, one of the urban south, my private school diction, familiar, familiar to those in power, to those that decide which Indians are acceptable and which are not. And there are many like me, the desired indigenous outcomes of a colonial Canadian dream, offered what amounts to that Canadian dream, and all it cost us was our ancestors, just like you. But I'm here to tell you, very forcefully, that I am not the future of Canada. I am but a sliver of the indigenous present. A, the sliver perhaps most prized by Canada, but a sliver nonetheless. No, I'm not the future of an indigenous Canada. I am but a portion of its presence, present, born from its past. But I believe there are windows to the future of Canada. Visions of what an indigenous Canada could be without the pressure and without the heat. And I believe these windows, these visions, can be found in our art, in our artists and our storytellers. They can help guide us to the direction of where our future is going, to know what Canada could become, and indeed, that is where, in this moment, in this future present, we must cast our gaze.
So what vision of the future do artists like Jeremy Dutcher show us? So Jeremy just won the Polaris Prize for his, yes. As you heard, he blends opera and classical music with indigenous stories sung in his language, which is only spoken by about 100 people currently. He transforms classical European mediums by making indigenous language, indigenous story, their center. He's taken what was brought here, and instead of supplanting his indigeneity, it instead, he's made it to service his indigeneity. A tribe called Red turned traditional powwow music into dubstep dubstep electronic music, remaking indigenous drum sounds for the new age, for the future. Chris Dirksen and her orchestral powwow, blending the drum with classical arrangements and instrumentation, creating something that is familiar to a multitude of nations and yet birthed from none of them. Kent Monkman recreates European masterworks but inserts indigenous presence into them, challenging notions of colonial erasure, of art history, of gender. His latest series is inspired by the work of Goya. Again, repurposing the culture brought to these lands, but subverting the colonial gaze, providing a venue for indigenous voice among European masters. Think of the music of Tanya Tagak, the evolution of an ancient technique, throat singing, into a new form that blends with Western music of all kinds, from punk rock to symphonies, proving that indigenous culture is not stagnant, is not simply an element of the past, but a vibrant presence in our present, a guidepost to our future. Barry Ace, who beads not with colored glass circles, but with transistors and circuits, the connective string of modern communication, 
beating itself, already an example for indigenous people of something brought here that we transformed into something of here, taking what some see as inconsequential into something of value and cultural meaning and significance. And of course, of course for me, there's the movies, themselves an expression of indigenous futures in their reliance of technology and the use of that technology to tell our own stories, our own way. Whether it's Zacharias Canuck working in a glulik to capture old stories in the most modern of ways, or Jeff Barnaby subverting genre to find their intersections with indigenous existence. Or Lisa Jackson, whose recent virtual reality work, Badabin, envisioned a future of Toronto whose indigenous roots are literally reaching out to consume the evidence of colonial existence. Artists naturally push our culture, and contemporary indigenous artists are showing us a pathway that can be applied beyond their own individual practices that could find itself beyond the arts world. There's a vision beyond the arts that we can look to as the arts are a physical expression of future building. And to do this, we must also first and in fact look back, back to when our ancestors had a very different vision of what Canada could be. We should look back to when our relationship was new and full of promise before it was damaged by promises broken before it was disrupted by notions of racial supremacy and the violent oppression used to enforce them. Canadians need only look back to the treaties their ancestors signed on their behalf. If we look to the peace and friendship treaties, so these are the treaties that were signed long before there was even a glimmer of Canada. The, the, uh, the agreements made before there was a Canada to obscure our vision of what a Canada could be or should be. If we look to the spirit of those agreements, of the vision those agreements imagine, one of shared stewardship, of sovereignty, of reciprocal relationships, and of course, of peace and friendship, we see a portrait of a very different Canadian future than the present we now live in. If we look to the wisdom of the wampum, of the stories they tell, the agreements they cement and seal, of the history they reveal, then we will find further guidance to the future imagined, one that acknowledges that we live in relation to each other, in relation to our own nations and those of other nations, and in relation to the animals and the land. If you don't know, this is the dish with one spoon wampum which is the wampum of this territory that we are on right now. And it holds a very powerful teaching in its beads. You can see the one dish in the center of the wampum. And the teaching of this wampum is that the world, this place, is the dish. We are allowed all to bring but one spoon. We are allowed to take but one spoon's worth, not the whole cutlery set, just the one spoon forth, spoon's worth. And that's because we need to leave a spoon for our ancestors and our relations to come. They remind us that the building of a nation, the maintenance of a nation, is found in relationships, equal relationships between us all and the elements that support our survival, the plants, the trees, the animals, the land. And we can see examples, for example, uh, in the school at the Norway House community that blends the teachings of the land with the teachings brought here, a school that allows our relationships to foster. Norway House is a small community in northern Manitoba, 200 kilometers north of Winnipeg. There at that school, they take the kids out on the land, they teach them their language, they teach them their cultural practice, and they also teach them math and science 
and the other things that, that have arrived here more recently. And I think when we look at communities like that, we actually need to consider what that would look like here in the South. Because why should it only be indigenous kids that reform their relationship with the land? Your children would benefit too from this relationship, from understanding. And why do we prize some knowledge, the knowledge that's relatively new or the ways of knowing that's relatively new to this place over the ways of knowing and being that uh, allowed us to sustain ourselves for millennia before they ever arrived here. Maybe, in fact, as we see Mother Earth torn asunder, we should be thinking about our relationship to the land and whether that is a relationship also in need of reconciliation, also in need of being repaired. We find examples in medicine, where doctors trained in Western medicine include the traditional healing practices, treating the spirit and the body with equal measure, our health as much a depiction of our relationship as our culture is. There's several of these places you can find. There's actually one just on Six Nations, which is not far from where we sit here today, where when you go to visit the doctor, they will also have a traditional healer there for you to treat you in your complete self not just your physical body, but also your mind and your spirit, the three parts of us that exist. In law, there is a, where a generation of trained indigenous lawyers seek to bring indigenous notions of governance and justice to systems that have been weaponized against us. You know, there's more indigenous lawyers now than at any other point in the history. And you know what the, what the majority of them do is they fight your government in court. Did you know that the government of Canada spends more money fighting indigenous peoples in courts than it does delivering services to us? That's, that's the Canada of the present. And we can see this even in economies, like the Eastern nations who through treaty and protest, protest to ensure their treaty rights, have gained control over their own natural resources, harvesting sustainably while employing the community and finding profit in both, bringing notions of reciprocity, relationships and community ownership into economies built on extraction and individual wealth. You saw in that video of Jeremy Dutcher, uh, one community out in the East, I've, I've had the privilege of meeting with, there's a, a group of three Mi'kmaq nations on the eastern coast of Quebec who have formed a collective. They, through protest, through decades of protest, managed to maintain their, their treaty rights, which gave them uh, rights over the lumber industry and over the fishery there, over the water and the land, not beneath the land. That's where Canadian courts managed to get their wind. Uh, with their wind, rights below the earth. Interesting. Think about that. But when I talk to them, it's so interesting. They manage the forestry. They manage the fishery sustainably. So uh, I talked to the head of this, this collective, these three nations that share this, and we talked about the forestry, and he said, well, we don't, we don't clear cut, and we don't use the machine. And by the machine, he meant this enormous machine operated by a single person, that can just devour a forest in an afternoon. It strips the forest clean. And he said, we don't use that machine. We use individuals, people, with chainsaws, the old, slightly old-fashioned way, slightly. Uh, and they harvest the trees, every one in every three, the sustainable way. You leave two and you take one. Reciprocity, a uh, you know, big belief in our communities is you never take more than you leave and you never take more than you need. And through that, that structure of, of sustainable forestry, not only is the resource extracted, what Canada so often wants is that natural resource. They get that, but the community is enriched by it. The community is employed by it. And when the, the leaders look at, look at all of that, they don't just count the physical money, the profits made, they count the employment, which many businesses would count as an expenditure. They look at that as profit for the community, because the community owns, the community is stewards of this land. I shouldn't say the community owns. 
Because for, for most of our peoples, we don't own land. The land owns us. And so it is possible to have indigenous leadership and indigenous ways of, of, of financial arrangements, of, of taking resources, to have them even in a capitalist system. But it is true that there are inherent clashes in cultural belief and practice that are hard to overcome, and capitalism remains the chief divergent worldview from the way indigenous people see it. But that does not mean that even capitalism could not be altered through an indigenous lens, that somehow our economy suffers when we weren't always chasing profit, but rather profit can be found in more than the bottom line of a ledger. So what must we do to build an indigenous future for Canada? There's the four sacred medicines. I carry tobacco in my pocket. It helps me when I give these, these talks. And there's, oh, there's a shot in Norway House. Not a great shot, but a shot nonetheless up north. You can see a great documentary by Alan Issa Bomsawin all about Norway House, if you'd like. So what must we do? What must we do? We must not stop. While talking like this is not an end, it is a means. And this cannot stop here tonight or next week or next year. We owe it to our children to never stop. In no small part, so that they may see that this will be part of their inheritance. That this is something that they will also have to do. That Canada is a project that they inherit and that transforming it is their right as well. We need to normalize a new vision for Canada by never forgetting the past that has been obscured. We do this through education first, through storytelling second, and through policy third. In all of these, Canada must embrace its indigenous nature. For Indigeneity is inseparable from Canada itself. And I, I wish this is the vision of Canada I had been taught in schools, that there simply is no Canada without indigenous peoples. None. And there is no future for Canada without us either. It's high time we accept this and begin to behave accordingly. And we must see for Canada's health Indigenous peoples determine their own future, not have a future forced upon them. For in that sovereignty lies the key to Canada's true identity. The future envisioned in the treaties our ancestors made for us. Only then can Canada truly be Canada. Our future is ours to determine. And I think that's you know, I, I get the privilege of, of doing these sorts of talks, not quite in a fancy place with a dinosaur. That's awesome. But I get to do these talks, you know, quite a bit. And, and one of my consistent messages to Canadian audiences is Canada needs to begin to be, need to be proud that it's an indigenous place. This is very unique in the world, this place. What is so unique about Canada it's not the French and English folks. It's not. Those are spoken a lot of places. It's the indigenous notion of Canada that's unique. <laughs> and I think Canadians should be proud of that. But you've been taught not to be, just like we've been taught not to be proud of who we are. And we need to learn to be actually proud together. Because, you know, the, here's the thing. Canada took a lot from my family. It's taken a lot from indigenous families in Canada. It took a lot from yours, too. It took my language and my culture from me. It took it from you, too. This was part of what Canada was supposed to see. Go back and read the Peace and Friendship Treaties and the future of Canada that they envision. It is very different. 
It's a place where we live side by side. It's a place where we share equally what is here. And yes, they were signed at a time when indigenous people outnumbered everyone else. So to keep in mind that it was peace and friendship sought by your ancestors from mine so that we may share together. And in the ensuing years, we lost that vision. We forgot those pieces of paper and those wampum belts. And if we actually want to know what our future looks like, we need to go back to look at the future that was imagined for us and correct what has taken us off course in that time. And I certainly hope that you'll join me in helping to build that future by making the changes necessary here in the present. I trust in the trust our ancestors showed us to do this. I trust in the land and the animals that support us, for we are the weakest of them all. So we owe them an incredible debt. and We need to get back to speaking to them with respect and honor because they don't hear us anymore. They need to hear us again so that we may live in balance with them. And I trust our future relations, those which we have not met and that we may never meet. I trust in them to find guidance in the actions that we will take now, just like we should find guidance in the actions they took when we first met. Let's light them a path to the future of Canada. Miigwech, miigwech, chi miigwech for listening. Ani bojo, glani desi Gabrielle Huche. It's an honor to be with you here this evening, and it's a particular honor for me to share the stage with you, Jesse. Um, I have been a fan and followed him for many years, and so let me be the first, but certainly not the last person to thank you for that moving and what was for me a very emotional discussion. So we have a few minutes here, um, and I want to cover a lot of ground, and in particular, you know, reflections, as you talked about, of where we've come as a country, the climate that we're currently in of truth and reconciliation, and, you know, as we talked about the future of where we're going to go in Canada. So I hope to cover all of that in the next 20 minutes. Right. So I first heard your very deep voice early in the morning on Metro Morning. And from there, that led me to your Twitter account. And I've followed you every day since. Now, I want to start with a tweet, actually, that you pinned on the top of your Twitter page. And I'm sure many of you follow him. And if you don't, you definitely should. And it says this. It's been up there for just over two years. We are all living history. What we do now resonates for generations. We should all try and behave accordingly. So given where you sort of ended your discussion, I'm curious what you know, thoughts you have on the things that we all should be discussing as Canadians and in terms to start to change our history and the history that we're making. Yeah, I, first of all, I, I'm so thrilled that you're here. You came all the way for this. This is what an honor, folks. Um, uh, you know, I, that, that quote is meant, to, is meant as much a reminder for myself as mm. anyone else that, you know, there's a, a story in Anishinaabe about the seventh fire, the, mm -hmm. the generation of the seventh fire, and seven generations. And, you know, the teaching that I had was Often when, when we think about that phrase, it is the future looking, but also it's to remind us that we are the result of seven years past. And so when I think of what we should be doing, I think some of it is just to um, grapple with our own place in time and space and understand the importance of being here in the moment right now, but mm -hmm. that, that's, that we carry forward something, that something is the result of what we, we do here. And so... And I hope that we should be making better choices. I, I worry that um, so much of the culture is a, 
is about what's happening, is about right now, is about mm -hmm. instant gratification. I mean, it's funny you see that on Twitter, an <laughs> engine of instant gratification. Um, and I think, you know, in the technology and, and the way our cultures advance has generally been around making things more convenient and easy on us in the moment. Mm -hmm. Be damned sort of what happens down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, A, I don't think that's what our ancestors, the way they thought mm -hmm. about the world. Certainly not my, under, my, my newer understandings of how we see time and place and those sorts of things. Um, but also I think it's self-defeating for cultures and societies to actually think that. I think we endanger ourselves when we don't consider um, what the future actually holds and begin to shape that in the, the, the present. So I think Canadians need to, I think there's a couple key things, and, and I, mm -hmm. I talked about it a bit, which is, you know, we have to be very honest, right, is that the story of Canada is, is a myth, the one we were all taught. Just like every other nation's creation myth is exactly that, a myth. And that for a lot of Canadians, you know, we weren't taught these things. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to reconcile things that you never even knew. You know, the most common phrase I hear from Canadians all across Canada is, I didn't know. I didn't know these things. Um, so we need to know. But I also think it's important to remind people that ignorance is an excuse only once. Mm -hmm. That you can use it once and it's over. And I think Canada might be out mm -hmm. of using that as an excuse. So I think, first of all, Canadians need to actually go back. We need to start teaching more foundational about what, what truly has happened here, the relationship that we actually started with. You know, I'm sure like, mm -hmm. like me, when you went to school, you know, I learned more about the Treaty of Utrecht than I did the treaty my own people signed, the Robinson-Huron Treaty that was signed in 1850, 1850 that, you know, was the treaty for a huge portion of what is Ontario, a treaty that without it, Canada doesn't exist as Canada. And yet, that never came up in any Canadian history class. And so, that is the baseline of where we need to start. And then I think we need to start being way more open with the ideas that, um, way more open that this, all of this, is way less permanent than we tend to invest into it and that we should actually take solace in that, that these things aren't permanent, they're, that they're not written in stone, mm -hmm. that they they're, can be changed. Nothing in nationhood is immutable. You know, you can, you can change. And that Canada, if we actually went back and learned our history, there's a couple things that would become very apparent right away. The first being that Canada as a nation is a baby, like an infant. I, you know, I'm not sure... I'm not sure it's potty trained, <laughs> to be honest, at this point. And, and again, part of that's just knowing that, like, you know, indigenous nations were here for, Anishinaabe people, for 15,000 years. So the Canada, the Canada 150 or Canada would pick your number is cute, but it's, it's cute like a baby. Like, a, it's an infant. But that we should also... Mm -hmm. You know, I talked about not being afraid. We should not be afraid to allow that baby to grow and begin to walk and, and, and to mature. And that we're as just as capable of guiding that maturity, that process of, of going into adolescence and becoming a grown-up, as our ancestors were in birthing the baby in the first place. That we're no less than them. We're the same as them. We're humans existing here and now, just as they were humans existing there and then. Mm -hmm. And they didn't think it was too daunting to start a country. We should not think it's too daunting to change one. Mm -hmm. So I want to touch on something that you said and something that you touched on in your talk as well. You know, if we're all, if you and I up here are a result of a colonial system, if everyone in this room arguably is a result of a colonial educational system, then holding that mirror up to ourselves and living in that space of truth, as you put it, is really uncomfortable work. And work that 
many people would rather not do. You know, something that I've heard a lot is, you know, why don't we just get over it? Why can't we all just get along? So I'm curious what you would say, you know, to that idea. That we just get over it? That we just, why can't we all just get along? Why does one community or conversation need to kind of dominate the Canadian psyche? Well, I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that that was, that's intended. That, they, that this was designed. I think we, we cede too much to like chance. And instead of saying, no, this is how these things were designed to work. So, and no matter what, pick your system in Canada, the educational system, the legal system, um, whatever it is, the, the financial, economic system, they were all designed. So those are choices. And the outcomes that we're seeing some of them are intentional, but a lot of them are pretty much exactly the way it was designed. So, you know, I think it's key that we, we understand it and take control, because sh that should, again, empower us, that, that these were, were choices made and that we can, we can make different choices, that we can be powered to change the system, to change the outcomes um, by knowing that this was designed, and thus we can break that design. When I specifically hear people say, get over it, and I hear that all the time, get over it. What I've learned is that they're not actually speaking to me. They're speaking to themselves. Hmm. That I don't have to get over anything. Uh, in, in many ways, I won't speak for you, but for a lot of indigenous people, like, we're not over it, we're in it. Mm -hmm. Every day, every moment we wake up, we're in it. Not over, it's not getting over anything. It's, you know, we're in it. I think when I hear someone else tell me to get over it, it's because they are the ones that need to get over it. It's that they've been confronted with information, truth, history, that they find deeply un uncomfortable and unsettling. And it is, it's very, I get it. These are really hard discussions because no one wants to think that they have benefited from violence and oppression. You have. We all have. This is what we're reconciling. And it's, it's really Canada that needs to get over it. It's really Canada that needs to actually sit down, you know, uh, in its high chair and have a, a moment of maturation where it says, you know, I did do these things. These things were terrible. I... Saying sorry is never going to be enough. And it's just true. Kids know this. Kids know if their brother, if, I have two kids. If my, and I was going to say, if the, my brother, if my son knocks down my daughter, it would be the other way around, if I'm going to be completely honest. So if my daughter knocked down my son, they know, he would know that she didn't mean when she said, oh, I'm sorry. He knows, because mm -hmm. he knows she's going to knock him down again. Kids are incredible divining rods of injustice. I mean, try slicing a birthday cake in a room full of kids, <laughs> and you know exactly what I mean. They know who got the corner piece with all the icing and who got the middle piece. They're, they're, and so um, I think with, when I hear those things, you know, and, and Murray Sinclair said it, you know, addressed this issue as well, to me that's a reflection. They're, they're projecting themselves onto us because we don't need to get over anything. Mm -hmm. We're in it, and we're going to be in it, and we're going to stay in it. It's Canada that needs to sort itself out and then come back in a different mindset, in a different space, in a place of real um, empathy and a real understanding and want to reform. You know, we hear a lot about nation-to-nation -nation relationships. And the reality is that's not what they really want at the moment. They don't really want a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. They want a nation-to-municipality relationship. They still want to govern us. And what we need to remind them is that that isn't their actual choice to make for us. That's not what the treaty... Go read the Huron-Robinson Treaty. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that in the words. And um, so I think we need to to let Canada sort of sort itself out a little bit while we heal. Um, mm -hmm. 
and I think Canada should should honor that um, that we we need to heal and we may need to heal for generations. This is not stuff that goes away very easily, and they need to to work on themselves to to grow a little bit, maybe get a little you know those first uneasy steps of childhood so that when when they're ready, we can actually run together you know that that the the small steps are what allow great leaps. So we need Canada to start taking some small steps and stop imagining that it's on us to do it for you. Mm -hmm. It isn't. It is not. Like, it's nice to be here. It's nice for, you, for us to be here and to do this. But it really isn't our job to do that. Do you believe or do you think that non-Indigenous Canadians have a role in the healing process? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I think that they need to provide space mm -hmm. and they need to start, you know, I think fundamentally, you know, the biggest challenge with, with healing and reconciliation and all of this is that the end game is murky at best at this moment mm -hmm. in terms of what that actually looks like. Um, but I think what Canada has to get comfortable with is it doesn't get to decide what it looks like. That's a challenge for nations to, to let that go. And for Canadians to get a little bit comfortable and far less afraid that what it is gonna end up looking like will somehow challenge their existence here. It isn't. Like, this is, the, this is the thing. We're not, no one is getting on a boat and shipping anyone home. None of that is happening. No one's moving into your spare bedroom. <laughs> my, my cousins aren't coming down to occupy anything. That's not what's gonna happen. What I think should happen is that we start to share way more equitably, that we start to live by the agreements our ancestors signed and want, expected us mm -hmm. to honor on their behalf. They expected it. Why did they sign it if they didn't think we would honor it? And move, move forward. So I think Canadians need to provide the space, but also be ready that the space may not come back. To them. Mm -hmm. And that includes the land. You know, we, we, we talk about it, I think for many Indigenous people, we skirt around it because it makes a lot of non-Indigenous people comfortable. But the real fact is there is no reconciliation without land. So, um, and we need Canadians not to fear what that, what that means. Mm -hmm. What it means to me, I think, is that we need to start rebuilding the relationship Indigenous peoples had with the land which was radically different than the relationship Canada has to the land. And we see evidence of this all the time. Do a flyover of a certain spot in Alberta and you can see a, a glaring hole in terms of that relationship. That's what we need to get back to. And, and as I, I hoped I said in this talk, I think you can apply those sorts of ideas to all the systems that we have, all of them, and that they're not mutually exclusive, you know, that um, even capitalism, as polar opposite to so many of our belief systems as it is, would still greatly benefit from our presence within it. And the, you mm -hmm. know, as you, yeah. as you've done with your career, it's possible to take even those systems that are so counter to us and infuse them with something that can benefit a much wider amount of of people, and that we should want that. That that's mm -hmm. that's a different. Because that, again, is the vision that our, that our ancestors wanted us to have. And I think for me, that's the bit of, a bit of a disconnect, is that um, this was not the way it was supposed to happen. And it did. And we need to, we need, Canada needs to go back on a first date with First Nations people so we can get to know each other a mm -hmm. little bit, hold hands a little bit, not kiss. Just hold hands, no Tinder swipe right or anything, <laughs> none of that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like we need to go back to that moment and reset and say, okay, we all acknowledge that this went pear-shaped a long time ago by people that are no longer here. How do we get back to what was, was envisioned? Mm -hmm. When I read those treaties, I see a beautiful place. I see a place that I see reflected in the artwork I showed. I see a place where there's both. 
that it coexists at the same time, mm -hmm. that one is not above the other, that the, we're sharing the same space at the same time, and we're not in conflict. And I think we need to embrace that. And as I said at the beginning, can Canada, you know, this is an indigenous place, this is Turtle Island. It will never not be Turtle Island. Um, so Canada needs to maybe grow comfortable with that fact and actually learn that that's a real strength for Canada. That's where, that's where Canada will, will be its greatest, is when it finally realizes that we are inseparable from it. That, that the whole point of the peace and friendship treaties was that those early newcomers were going to die here. That's, go back and read the stories. They were. Mm -hmm. We helped because that's we saw a vision of what could be. Um, let's get back to that relationship, mm -hmm. not of you of everyone dying, but back <laughs> to the relationship of recipro reciprocity, of of sharing. Because our ancestors, meaning our First Nations ancestors, they looked and they knew this land was incredible. They knew this land could sustain everyone. They knew that. That's why it was, they were not threatened by this, and we should get back to knowing that, and that, that it's, I'm not free until my brother is free, and my sister is free, and Canadians aren't free until I am, and, and my people are free. Until we get to that point, mm -hmm. we're always going to be talking a little bit across purposes. I heard somebody say it once that we've been living beside one another for a very long time, but we still don't know one another, and... You know, I think it, we'd all agree that Canada and Canadians, we have a lot of learning to do. So I can't believe it, but it's already time for the last question. Oh, wow. And... I do prattle on. <laughs> no, this is very informative. It's great. And we do have a reception afterwards as well. So hopefully we can ask you a few questions there. Yeah. So given all the learning that Canada and Canadians have to do on this, I'm curious if there are resources outside of the ones that you pointed to in your talk that you could you know, maybe point us to or some homework that you can give us in terms of engaging people who are not necessarily in this room with this important work? I mean, there's so many. Um, uh, I mean, certainly I, the art is key. I think our stories have always been in our art even when we weren't allowed to tell our stories, where it was illegal in Canada to tell our stories. Mm -hmm. They were still there in our art. We just hid them in there. So, so I think Canadians should go, and it's, quite frankly, I think it's why so many of our artists are so prominent in the moment, is that Canada is yearning for this understanding, and they're finding it right now, anyway, in arts, because it's harder to infuse that in educational systems and legal systems and economies and all of those other systems, those take a little bit longer. Art, you just have to find some good artists and you're off to the races. So I think that's why they're on the, the, the bleeding edge. But you know what I tell when people ask me that, the simplest thing I say? Go to a powwow. You know, I was giving a speech in Winnipeg, or was it Saskatoon last week? I can't remember, one of them. And one of the audience members said, I'm allowed at a powwow? And I was like, yeah, that's what they're made for. Like, they're literally yeah. a community ceremony meant to invite everyone yeah. to come and dance and eat. Um, and yet I think Canadians have somehow always been on the outside of that circle. And I think it's so simple because they're everywhere. Like, it's not really powwow season at the moment because mm -hmm. we don't do it in the winter. Uh, but, you know, come summer, Toronto has like numerous ones that occur mm -hmm. throughout the year. Everywhere in Canada, practically, has some form of this gathering. Go, buy, a, buy some beading, eat, an, eat a taco, um, watch the dancing. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is our community at its most welcoming. This is us partying and sharing together. The, the original idea of these celebrations was to bring everyone together. And they're absolutely for Canadians. In fact, there may be no more of a Canadian thing than to attend a powwow. Uh, you know, it, one, of my, one of my favorite things, and I'll leave on this, is I'm on the board of the Canada Council for the Arts. 
and they recently redid all of their funding structures. And one of the things they started funding were powwows. For, the, for they had never funded powwows as a cultural event, the Canada Council for the Arts. And now you can apply for funding for your powwow. And I think, yeah. And I just think that it's such a small, like it seems inconsequential almost, because mm -hmm. you and I have probably attended a thousand yeah. powwows in our life. But what I realize is when I'm standing there, not enough people are there, that not all the people that should come to this celebration should come. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I could tell you to read the TRC, to, to watch some movies, read Arthur Manuel's book, read any of the books, they're all so great, so many of them. Um, but I can tell you the simplest thing ever, go to a party called the Pow Wow, enjoy yourself, and then go back the next year and bring, you know what, bring someone who hasn't been with you the next time you go. And do that every year, and soon we'll all be at the same powwow. <laughs> and that would be awesome. I love that.